Welcome to our deep dive into the world of Rupert Sheldrake. Yeah. Um, we've got a stack of his interviews and articles. Wow. And even a scientific paper to explore. And I think you're going to find this one especially captivating. Yeah. Sheldrake's ideas challenge the very foundation of how we understand consciousness. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to see how those ideas might be particularly relevant in the age of AI. That's right. What's so intriguing about Sheldrake is that he doesn't shy away from questioning mainstream scientific thinking. Right. He actually started his career as a conventional biologist. Okay. But he found that the dominant materialistic view, uh -huh. which tries to reduce everything to physical matter and processes, just couldn't account for some of the biggest mysteries in biology. Okay, so he was bumping up against the limits of what traditional science could explain. Yeah. What pushed him to start exploring these alternative ideas about consciousness? Well, a few things. He talks about his time in India studying plant development, where he was exposed to Eastern philosophies. That embraced the idea of consciousness being inherent in nature. Okay. This isn't some fringe idea in those traditions. Right. It's a core concept. And that exposure really opened him up to considering different ways of understanding the world. It's like those cultures are saying, hey, maybe we don't have to make consciousness so complicated. Yeah. But it wasn't just philosophy that influenced him. Right? right. He also points to some scientific puzzles that suggest materialism might be missing something crucial. Exactly. One example he often brings up is the missing heritability problem. Okay. Scientists have been trying to figure out how traits are passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. Genes obviously play a big role. Of course. But even when we factor in epigenetics, uh -huh. which looks at how the environment influences genes. Right there's still a chunk of inheritance that can't be accounted for. Right. It's like there's an invisible hand-shaping development. Wow. And Sheldrake thinks this points to a kind of memory inherent in nature itself. Ah. And that's where his famous theory of morphic resonance comes in. Yes. This is where things start to get really mind-bending. Morphic resonance is a core concept in Sheldrake's work. Okay. It's the idea that self-organizing systems, okay. from crystals to organisms to societies, right inherit a kind of collective memory from previous similar systems. Mm -hmm. He suggests that this memory is transmitted across space and time through what he calls morphic fields. Morphic fields. These fields contain a blueprint, a pattern of information okay. that influences the development and behavior of subsequent systems. So it's not just about individual learning. Right. It's like there's a pool of shared experience that we can tap into. Yeah. Can you give an example of what this might look like in the real world? Well, one of the most famous examples is a study on rat learning. Oh, well. Researchers taught rats in one lab to escape from a particular type of maze. Mm -hmm. After the rats mastered the task rats of the same breed in labs all over the world, seemed to learn the same maze much faster, as if they were somehow drawing on the experience of the initial group. Wow. Now, there are other explanations for this, but Sheldrick argues that it points to the possibility of a kind of non-local learning happening through morphic resonance. That's incredible. Yeah. It challenges the idea that learning is solely an individual process confined to the brain. Right. And Sheldrake doesn't just apply this idea to animals, right? No. He talks about crystals, too. Yes. He suggests that crystals are another example of morphic resonance at work. Okay. He points to the fact that certain chemical compounds become easier to crystallize in labs around the world after they've been crystallized many times before. Mm. It's as if the crystals themselves are learning from previous generations of crystals through this shared memory field. So they're learning too. Of course, this is a controversial idea, and mainstream science offers different explanations. Yeah. But Sheldrake argues that morphic resonance offers a more elegant and holistic understanding of these phenomena. Okay, so we're starting to see how morphic resonance could rewrite our understanding of how information is transmitted mm -hmm. and how systems evolve. Yeah. But Sheldrake's ideas about consciousness go even further than this, don't they? Yes, they do. He doesn't think the mind is just limited to the brain. Absolutely. He proposes another radical idea called the extended mind. The extended mind. He argues that the mind is not confined to the physical boundaries of the brain, but extends outward into the world through our senses and interactions. Okay. He suggests that we're constantly picking up information and influencing our environment through unseen connections. So you're saying our minds are sort of leaking out into the world around us? In a way, yes. I've got to admit that sounds a little out there. Is there any scientific basis for this idea? Sheldrake points to a number of phenomena that support his view. Okay, like what? One is the feeling of being stared at. 
Black. He's actually conducted experiments where people try to guess whether someone is staring at them through a video link. And the results suggest that we might be more sensitive to this kind of unseen gaze than chance would allow. Interesting. He argues that this sense of being stared at is a rudimentary form of telepathy. Telepathy. A connection between minds that goes beyond the usual senses. That's fascinating. And haven't you said he also collaborated with a well-respected neuroscientist on an experiment involving chicks? Yes. Uh. He worked with Stephen Rose on a study looking at conditioned aversion in chicks. Okay. Basically, they paired a yellow light with a substance that made the chicks feel sick. Right. Over time, the chicks learned to avoid the yellow light. Yeah. But what was interesting was that Sheldrake predicted that as more and more chicks went through this experiment over time, mm -hmm. new chicks would become even more reluctant to approach the yellow light. Okay. As if they were inheriting the aversion from previous generations through morphic resonance. So it's like the collective memory of avoid the yellow light was getting stronger with each generation of chicks. That's the idea. The actual results of the experiment are complex and open to interpretation. Yeah, of course. And Rose himself didn't necessarily agree with Sheldrake's conclusions. Right. But the study highlights Sheldrake's commitment to rigorous scientific inquiry, mm. even when exploring ideas that challenge conventional thinking. It sounds like he's not just throwing out wild theories. Mm -hmm. He's trying to test them empirically. Right. Which is what science is all about. Exactly. This is where I think the implications for AI become really interesting. Yeah. If consciousness isn't just confined to brains, mm. if it's more fundamental than we thought, then what does that mean for the possibility of creating truly conscious machines? That's a huge question and one that Sheldrake has given a lot of thought to. We'll dive deeper into his perspectives on AI in just a moment. Okay, I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be good. So we were talking about his ideas on morphic resonance and the extended mind and how they challenge the conventional view of consciousness. Right. Now let's shift our focus to what these ideas mean for artificial intelligence, a field that's rapidly changing our world. Right, because if consciousness isn't limited to the brain, mm. if it's a more fundamental aspect of reality, yeah. then does that mean we could potentially create machines that are truly aware, mm. that experience the world subjectively like we do? Sheldrake is skeptical of the idea that current AI based on digital computers okay. will ever achieve true consciousness. Right. He argues that these machines, while incredibly powerful at processing information and solving problems, uh -huh are fundamentally deterministic. They operate according to a fixed set of rules and algorithms. I see. They lack the kind of open-ended creativity, yeah. intuition, and spontaneity that he sees as hallmarks of consciousness. So it's not just about intelligence. It's about a certain quality of experience. Yes. A sense of being in the world that's missing from current AI. Exactly. Sheldrake points to the example of DeepMind, okay. Google's AI system that's achieved incredible feats. Like what? Like mastering the game of Go and even predicting the 3D structure of proteins. That's incredible. Yeah, he acknowledges that these are impressive accomplishments. But he argues that DeepMind is essentially a sophisticated pattern recognition machine. Okay. It's not experiencing the world or understanding the meaning of the patterns. It's processing. It's like the difference between translating a language perfectly mm -hmm. and actually understanding the culture and nuances behind the words. That's a great analogy. Thanks. Sheldrake believes that true understanding requires a level of subjective experience, a sense of being in the world that current AI simply lacks. Uh, he suggests that a different kind of computing, perhaps based on analog systems mm, or incorporating quantum randomness, interesting. might hold more potential for generating genuine AI consciousness. So he's not ruling out the possibility entirely. Right. But he thinks we need a different approach. But let's go back to morphic resonance for a second. Okay. If we are all connected through these fields, wouldn't that mean that our own consciousness could potentially influence the development of AI? That's a very thought-provoking question. Yeah. Sheldrake has talked about how human intentions and beliefs can shape morphic fields. Oh. And he suggests that this might play a role in the development of new technologies. Right. It's possible that our collective imagination and desire for conscious machines mm. could actually influence the way AI evolves. Wow perhaps even pushing it towards a more holistic and embodied form of intelligence. So we might be unconsciously guiding AI towards consciousness just by thinking about it and imagining it. It's a possibility. That's a pretty wild idea. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We've been focusing a lot on the scientific aspects of Sheldrake's work. Yeah. But he also explores the spiritual implications of these ideas, doesn't he? Absolutely. 
He sees consciousness as a fundamental property of the universe, not just a product of biological evolution. Yeah, okay. He suggests that the materialist view, mm -hmm. which sees consciousness as emerging from complex arrangements of matter, right. might be getting things backwards. What if consciousness is the primary reality and matter is simply one way it manifests itself? Okay, now we're really venturing into mind-blowing territory. Yeah. So you're saying that consciousness is like the underlying fabric of the universe mm -hmm. and everything we experience, right. including our physical bodies and the material world, mm -hmm. is a kind of projection of this universal consciousness. That's a good way to put it. Sheldrick draws parallels between his ideas and concepts from various spiritual traditions. Like what? For example, he connects morphic fields to the Jungian idea of the collective unconscious, oh. a reservoir of shared archetypes and experiences that influence human behavior. So you're saying that these ancient traditions might have been tapping into the same underlying reality that Sheldrake is describing with his scientific language. That's possible. That's fascinating. Yeah. And he doesn't just talk about traditional religions. He also brings up psychedelic experiences, right? Yes, he sees psychedelic experiences as potential windows into this larger realm of consciousness. Okay. He suggests that these substances might temporarily disrupt the filters of our ordinary perception, uh -huh. allowing us to glimpse the interconnectedness of all things and experience a sense of unity with the cosmos. Hmm. He also points to the resurgence of pilgrimage as a sign that people are yearning for this kind of connection to something greater than themselves. Pilgrimage. Like walking for miles to visit sacred sites. Exactly. What does that have to do with morphic fields and cosmic consciousness? Sheldrake sees pilgrimage as more than just a physical journey. Okay. He suggests that these sacred sites, mm -hmm. which have been imbued with the intentions and prayers of countless people over centuries, wow. may act as powerful attractors for morphic resonance. So it's like these sites have become saturated with a kind of spiritual energy that can influence the experiences of those who visit them. That's the idea. That's a pretty interesting idea. He also points out that many ancient pilgrimage routes follow lines of energy, what some call Lail lines. Lay lines. That connect sacred sites across vast distances. Right. He suggests that these lines might be channels for morphic resonance. Interesting. Further enhancing the interconnectedness between people and places. It's a fascinating blend of science, spirituality, and ancient wisdom. It is. But before we get too lost in the mystical realms, let's bring it back down to Earth for a moment. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground today, from morphic resonance to the extended mind to the spiritual implications of Sheldrake's ideas. What are the key takeaways for our listeners, especially in this age of AI? Well, I think one of the biggest takeaways is that consciousness might be far more expansive and interconnected than we've traditionally believed. Okay. Sheldrake challenges us to consider the possibility that our minds are not isolated entities confined to our skulls, right. but rather nodes in a vast web of consciousness that extends throughout the universe. And if that's true, then it has profound implications for how we understand ourselves, yes. our relationship to technology, and even the potential for creating truly conscious machines. Exactly. Sheldrake's work invites us to reconsider the boundaries we've drawn between science and spirituality, mm -hmm. between mind and matter, and to embrace a more holistic and interconnected view of reality. Okay, we've explored some pretty mind-bending ideas today. But before we wrap up our deep dive into the world of Rupert Sheldrake, there's one more fascinating piece of the puzzle we need to explore. Oh, really? He connects his ideas to a modern phenomenon that at first glance might seem completely unrelated to the resurgence of pilgrimage. That's right. Welcome back to our deep dive into the world of Rupert Sheldrake. Before the break, we were about to explore this intriguing connection he makes between his ideas and the modern resurgence of pilgrimage. It might seem like a surprising leap at first. Yeah. But Sheldrake argues that pilgrimage offers a powerful lens through which to understand the nature of consciousness and our place in the cosmos. Okay, I'm all ears. How does he connect the dots between pilgrimage morphic resonance and the extended mind? He suggests that pilgrimage is more than just a physical journey to a sacred site. It's a way of tapping into a collective memory, a kind of morphic resonance okay. that's been built up over centuries of people visiting those places with similar intentions and aspirations. So each pilgrim is adding their energy, their prayers, their experiences to a kind of morphic field associated with that particular site. Yes. And then that field influences the experiences of future pilgrims. Precisely. It creates a feedback loop, a resonance across time. 
Wow. Where the intentions and experiences of past pilgrims shape the experiences of those who follow in their footsteps. That's a really fascinating idea. Yeah. It makes you wonder if certain places might hold a kind of energetic charge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a kind of spiritual gravity that draws people to them. Sheldrake would say yes, absolutely. He also connects this to the concept of the expended mind, okay. suggesting that our minds are drawn beyond themselves during pilgrimage, reaching out to connect with something greater, something transcendent. In this resurgence of pilgrimage, he sees it as a kind of counter movement to the dominant materialistic worldview, a mm. sign that people are yearning for something more than just a purely physical explanation of reality. Exactly. He contrasts pilgrimage with tourism, which he sees as a more superficial way of experiencing a place. The tourist takes photos, check things off their list, and moves on. Yeah. While the pilgrim engages with the site on a deeper, more meaningful level, they're participating in a ritual, a tradition, a lineage of seeking that stretches back through time. It's like the difference between reading about a historical event and actually visiting the place where it happened. Yes. You're immersing yourself in the atmosphere, the energy, the historical resonance of that location. He also points out that many ancient pilgrimage routes follow lines of energy, what some call landline lines, oh, I mean, line. that connect sacred sites across vast distances. He suggests that these lines might be channels for morphic resonance, mm -hmm. further enhancing the interconnectedness between people and places. Wow. So we're talking about an invisible web of energy linking sacred sites around the world. Yes. Infused with the intentions and experiences of countless pilgrims throughout history. It's a pretty powerful image. It is, and it highlights how Sheldrake is weaving together scientific ideas with spiritual concepts, challenging us to see the world in a more holistic and interconnected way. He's not saying science is wrong, but rather that it needs to expand its framework to include these subtler dimensions of reality. It's like he's saying, hey, science, you've done amazing things, but don't stop there. There's a whole other layer of reality waiting to be explored. Exactly. And it's not just about ancient traditions either. Wow. He even connects pilgrimage to the modern phenomenon of psychedelic retreats where people are using substances like ayahuasca to access altered states of consciousness and connect with the sense of the sacred. So he sees these retreats as a kind of contemporary form of pilgrimage where the journey is inward rather than outward, but the intention is similar to transcend the limitations of the everyday self and connect with something larger. It's like a pilgrimage into the depths of consciousness itself. That's a beautiful way to put it. Sheldrake's work challenges us to reconsider the boundaries we've drawn between science and spirituality. Between the material and the immaterial, he's proposing a vision of reality where everything is interconnected, where consciousness is fundamental, and where we are all part of something much larger than ourselves. So after this deep dive into the world of Rupert Sheldrake, where are we left? What can our listeners take away from all this? I think one of the most important takeaways is the invitation to cultivate a sense of wonder and curiosity about the nature of reality. Sheldrake encourages us to question our assumptions, yeah, to be open to new possibilities, and to recognize that our current understanding of the universe might be just the tip of the iceberg. It's like he's saying, don't be afraid to ask the big questions even if the answers seem strange or challenging. Yeah. Keep exploring, keep experimenting, keep pushing the boundaries of knowledge and experience. Exactly. And remember, if Sheldrake is right and the universe is a symphony of interconnected consciousness, then each of us plays a part in that symphony. Wow. Our thoughts, intentions, and actions all contribute to the overall harmony. So the question is, what kind of music will you create? How will you use your awareness, your intentions, your actions to contribute to the beauty and wonder of the cosmos? That's something to ponder as we wrap up our deep dive. It is indeed. And who knows, maybe this conversation has created its own morphic resonance rippling out to inspire others to explore these ideas and add their own unique notes to the cosmic symphony. That's a beautiful thought to end on. Thanks for joining us on this mind-bending journey into the world of Rupert Sheldrake. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep expanding your awareness.